I am Sue Aspley from the libraries, and this is Ann Quinn. And I'm going to start off with some basics on copyright. And as we look at social media, whether all the formats here, whether you're dealing with print, YouTube, Flickr, images, video, meaning film, sound recordings, across the board, copyright is going to be basically the same considerations. Don't think because I am dealing with this image necessarily the basic copyright premises change. They don't. There are a few caveats, as always with the law, you make a big general statement and then you start backing off a little bit. However, the basics here, because we are dealing with a law that the major, last major revision was in 1976, has not caught up with the technology. So therefore, we are not in the most up-to-date mode, you might say, legally. The one exception is the TEACH Act that was passed with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in 2000 that deals with videos and some aspects of distance education. Otherwise, we're back to 1976. Now, what does it take for something to be under copyright? There are just three basics. This is found in the United States Constitution, which shows the importance of copyright in this country. Why is it important in this country? Because our founding fathers came from the United Kingdom, and there, there was a form of censorship on creativity. You had to get the king's permission, his stationary office at one time, to publish. Your first statute was 1703, the Act of Queen Anne, that started the modern day concept of copyright. You have limited rights in your work. Our founding fathers had gone through some of that censorship, so therefore the prominence in United States law of copyright. Another factor to keep in mind, originally it started out the states could put their spin on it. This changed. In 1909, copyright, for the most part, became federal. So with this, you're dealing with federal law. What does that mean? That means if you have a copyright at work and it's your own in California, the same rules are going to apply in New York. It's uniform across the board, which gives you a sense of predictiveness and how do I deal with this. If I go to a conference in, say, Chicago, same rules. This provides uniformity and equanimity under the law under this. The basics of copyright are, one, you have to own the rights in the work to claim it. Two, it has to be original. Three, it has to be in tangible form. That's it, folks. Three simple requirements. If you have those, then your work right now is under copyright. You say, I didn't rush into the copyright office and register it. You don't have to anymore. As soon as those three points are in existence, the work is under copyright. Why would you want to register it? Because if it is a very unique product, and I've had faculty come and ask me because they're concerned about their work being misused or abused. You might have to sue at some point in time, then it needs to be registered to collect damages. Otherwise, it may not. Now, we have a copyright site. This is the copyright advisory site. We have a number of web guides on here for you that provides more information. Under copyright, we have alternatives for you in music and other things. There is a libguide on basics. We are going to go into Creative Commons later in this workshop. There is a very detailed guide on fair use and open access and public domain. 
what are the first questions you should ask yourself when trying to determine? First, look to see is the work really under copyright? If it is in the public domain. Anything before 1923 in the United States is in the public domain, so look at your dates. Another factor here, any works before 1976 had to be re-registered. If you've got something that was not re-registered, and there's some out there, not under copyright. If it is a work of the federal government, federal, it is not under copyright. Like you go to the Department of Justice, pull off a report, it is not under copyright. Creative Commons works that we are going to talk about are not under copyright. And these are all in the public domain. Now, as far as states go, it can vary. California is very good and very advanced. Most of the work of the state of California is open and usable. So those are the first things you need to look at. Now, if you didn't get past it at that point, you still under a copyright, then you look for an exception. One exception, the libraries have numerous ones that are in the statute we use. This is the way we loan books. It is an exception in the law. This is the way we put materials on the reserve, exception in the law. This is the way we do interlibrary loan, exception in the law. You too have one of the most important exceptions in the law. This is fair use. This is a doctrine of equity. Become familiar with it because if you run up to this and you see this work is under copyright, the next step is can I bring this in under fair use? Fair use originated in the courts. The reason being is you have a product. You have written a book. I want to use parts of that book in my class. We have a competing interest here, maybe. This happens again and again. The copyright holder and the person that wants to use that work, maybe in education. How do the courts deal with this? They came up with a balancing test that was used in the courts for years. This is what common law normally is, judge-made law, court law. They used it. Eventually, it was so helpful, they enfolded it into the Copyright Act of 1909. This is your fair use analysis that you go through. And on our site, Fair use, we have in here information. We also have what is known as the fair use checklist that was developed by Kenny Cruz at Columbia and Duane Butler at the University of Louisville. This is an analysis that can help you. It goes through the four factors. The first factor you consider is the purpose. Now, in education, we usually do pretty well on that first factor. It's you're using it in education, research. You're using it for commentary, criticism. In there is the exception for news reporting, too. And let's go to the checklist. It is on our website. You can link into it. It's a PDF. Your first factor is the nature of the use, the purpose here. You can see this favors fair use. That does not. You can see why we would do real well on this first factor in education. Also, I would note right here, transformative. This has become very, very important with courts. You can have fa fair use without it being transformative, but it ups the ante in your favor if it is there. What do I mean by transformative? I mean that you are reconfiguring this work, it could be an article in some way, that you are using it in a different way than it was intended. You're using it for your students, criticism, commentary. This can be a transformative use. Think about that. The next factor is the nature of the work. And these are Factual works that have been published 
favor, fair use, those that are highly creative have not been published, like somebody's diary, do not favor fair use. You go down through this. The third factor, and this can give you problems sometimes, is how much. Always remember, if you never think of the other things here, use only what you need. If you're dealing with videos or you're dealing with sound recordings, DVDs, be sure it's lawfully acquired. And even there, use only what you need for your pedagogy. You may have heard of these rules of thumb that I can use one chapter, I can use 10%. This is not the law. This is something publishers promulgate it over the years, and we used those at one time as the bare minimum. It was never meant to be the maximum on you. Do your analysis. See what you can justify here, because nine times out of ten, if you're acting reasonably and you have a decent explication of what you're doing here, you may be all right. We won't really know till a judge tells you. The last factor is effect on the market. Now, in using textbooks and portions of textbooks, this is where we could run afoul in academia. So keep that in mind, that um, otherwise the market effect doesn't really hit us that hard. It does in the recording industry, the movie industry. There's where you see a very uh, litigious society. That is your fair use checklist. It's online. Go in and use it because the purpose of this is to alert you that maybe you have a problem. That's all it's for. If you've got a problem, then you may want to think, this is too risky. Come talk to me. Or I may need to look at an alternative. Aside from the fair use exemption, which is one of your best friends in the law, the other thing is we always have the permissions market we can go to. And then lastly, we have Creative Commons that we're going to talk about. Now on your handout, I have put the factors you need to ask yourself as you start out looking at copyright. Do those. Go through that and see where you are. And we're always available. I'm just a phone call away. Shoot me an email, and we can look at it further. And now I'm going to turn it over to Ann. So the next thing, so we, um, this, this session actually started because our man, Steve here from ITT, uh, works a lot with Sakai and our vendor. And there was a decision made that we want faculty to, especially for students, did you know what we're going to talk about you, Steve? Uh, to put stuff on YouTube. So it occurred to me that, wow, because wow, Sakai is completely secure, right? You have to have your login, students are registered. Then now we're in this very public forum, potentially. So I thought it would be good to talk about how to use YouTube and deal a little bit with some of the privacy issues and the copyright issues, because um, some of you may be copyright holders. And as soon as you create something on YouTube, essentially you've become a copyright holder. Now you've created a tangible work, right? So we got, we got Sue involved since she's the expert. And where I met Sue, I used to work for the School of Adult and Professional Studies. And we were converting a program, a degree program in Christian leadership. And in the face-to-face -face environment, they would show movies or parts of movies, just you know, regular two-hour narrative movies like Patton. Or, you know, and they talk about, look at the family dynamics and stuff like that. And so in talking with Sue, we realized we can't just, you know, digitize those and put them online. It's, it's not, not allowable. So we went through this whole process as Sue was talking about of what can you do. And I think as the university uh, develops more online courses and blended courses, we need to be aware of that. Um, and we also have, uh, Tom is in charge of um, online course development. So he deals with a lot of these stuff, uh, these things as well. So please chime in, Tom. So um, I thought it would be good to cover a little bit about YouTube. And so you have four handouts today. So kind of our structure for today is Sue started with some of the, um, the basic copyright info. And then we want to look at some of the how-to and considerations for various media moving from video um, 
and then Creative Commons in general, which we'll define, and art and music and text. So kind of walking through those. So let's start with, um, with YouTube. So I, I have a basic handout for you on how to use YouTube, because you're now encouraged to use it. So in the handout, first it talks about uploading an existing movie. So whether you've acquired one or you've made one with your phone or something like that. Um, so it, we, have, we walk through how to, how to upload the movie once you've created it. And then if you go to the, um, this third page, it talks about what file formats are compatible. And then it also talks about privacy settings. When you, so you'll notice it, when, you, when you upload a video, there's a setting here. It says public or there's drop down, and they have three different settings. So I want to play for you just a, just a, you know how YouTube is, right? In terms of quality, it's sort of <laughs> here to there. It's kind of like not a great quality video, but it gives the information. So I just want to play this for you that explains the difference between those different privacy settings. So let's say you're on YouTube and you want to upload a video. Well, YouTube has three settings, public, unlisted, and private. But most people who upload don't really understand what they mean. The default is public, and that's the one that 95% of YouTubers know about. For the public setting, you can find your video on YouTube or even Google. And then your pathetic, I mean awesome video, has a chance of growing because other people can find it. And then it can go viral. Once viral, it could be on the front page of CNN or MSN. And who knows, maybe one day you could be on the Today Show sitting next to Matt or Savannah explaining how your awesome video became viral. With the private setting, things are a little different. You see, private is a secure way of storing your videos and having complete control of who views it. In this case, whatever you uploaded would not appear in the YouTube and Google search results. You would only be able to view it from your video manager when you logged onto your channel. But an average person, some random stranger who happens to randomly pursue or peruse your channel, would not be able to see your private video. It would only be viewable to you. Oh, and up to 50 other people. Yes, once you log in, you can share your video with up to 50 close family and friends provided that they have YouTube accounts. So just log into YouTube and send emails to your family and friends and other members, and they can receive a link in their email that they can now view your video. Once they receive the link, only they can watch it. With unlisted, the results will not appear in the search. Like private videos, your unlisted videos will only appear in your video manager. Outside users will not be able to see them. The difference is unlisted involves a shareable link and can be viewed by anyone, even those without a YouTube account. So if you post the link to your close circle of family and friends, and your friends happen to post your video to sites such as Facebook, WordPress, Twitter, or even send it out via email, anyone who has access to the link can view it. Unlisted videos can't typically go viral because they can't be searched by strangers. But if the movement of link sharing is powerful enough, enough people can view the video, and maybe you could end up on the Today Show. So in conclusion, Unlisted is a great alternative to people who want a more restrictive way of sharing their video without making it fully private. I have to highlight, too, I have to ask you, did you find the music distracting? Did you notice that it was, didn't know? Okay. So, because we want to talk about media. Okay. So that's, that's those different listings. So private is actually the most secure. So let's see here. The other thing, I guess, Sorry, I don't have something to show you right now. So the other thing to consider then is if you're asking your students to use YouTube, sometimes it's maybe not so much a copyright issue, issue as a privacy issue. Um, you may be asking students to talk about some of their own personal experiences, um, you know, et cetera. 
And I want to kind of open it up at this point to see if anyone has had experiences using YouTube or other, other video servers and so forth, and kind of what, yeah? Uh, one thing on privacy is that uh, keep in mind the students own the copyright in their work unless they've signed it away. This comes up sometimes. And the other thing is that privacy, again, like copyright law, has not caught up with the digital environment. That, in fact, at one time, privacy wasn't even a cause of action in the law. The United States was the first in the 1890s to come up with the concept, and it was in the iconic law review article by Justice Brandeis and his law partner Summers that came up with the right to be alone, the right to privacy. It has developed, but your torts for privacy are those that were come up, that were developed by Prostner, who was at Stanford Law School in the 1930s. So therefore, you're limited sometimes at, for causes of action. And we have a book that's been published, two volumes, by our communications department that deals with social media ethics. And there's a chapter in here on privacy. I'll pass this around. And that's actually also in your resources. Uh, in this document at the bottom is, is the citation. The book is kind of expensive, though. So, so just make a copy of it. No. <laughs> <laughs> Share it. Yeah, put it on the internet. <laughs> and and um, I know, Mike, that when you, when you make videos, you put them in Google Docs. Is that right? OK. So then that's, that's, that's private as well. And because sometimes, um, if, if the person who actually posted the video is not the copyright holder, they can be asked to take it down. And then you could give a link to students that, you ever seen that little square face? And they go, this, you know, this, is, this video has breaking copyright, broken copyright rules, it's not here anymore. So it's, it is good if you use existing links from other, you know, other people to check them at the beginning of the term or the beginning of, you know, Make sure they're still there. It's, that, is, that is a best practice. What, what if you're not linking like Maria does? You get into the same issues using YouTube, whether you're using a small portion or the whole YouTube, as you do in passing out copies, copying a chapter of a book. Same issue applies there. So remember, one of our solutions, go through those questions. If it's a student video, you might can get permission. If it's one of your colleagues' videos, you might can get permission. But one thing I didn't say is even though we have all these things, attribution didn't go out the window, folks. If we're using somebody else's work, we still give them credit. We still, in our minds, because we have worked with print materials, still do in academia so much, we don't stop and think, oh, let me see if I feel comfortable bringing this in under fair use. The thing is, it is your determination. And a lot of times, it's how much risk do you want to absorb. You felt like you were trying to do everything reasonable to minimize any copyright infringement here. And that is where fair use analyzing it comes in. And the Georgia State case that um, has been remanded back, but it dealt with over 100 instances of materials that had been put up in the library's electronic reserve. Now, the judge, even at the federal trial level, found 96 of those came under fair use. The professors hadn't done their due diligence with the checklist all the time. But they could get up there just like you did right then and explain what they had done. They were trying to act reasonably. So therefore, the courts are moving. We've had at least four very important federal decisions in 2014 that supports some of our work in academia. So should, 
just That's remember, right. fair use. So then, would Mike be better if he only did part of the video or transformed it in some way, or any, any thoughts on? Well, the important thing is what can you justify for your pedagogy? This is where those rules of thumb, use one chapter, use 10 lines, use only 10%, present problems. If Sometimes if you can justify using 10%, you can justify perhaps using the whole thing because the same principles, the same reasoning are applying. So therefore, if you can justify the whole thing then and you can explain it, it's the risk you're willing to tolerate. If not, you may want to pull back a little bit. And the point is, it is the rule, use only as much as you need. Mm -hmm. If you don't need the whole thing, then don't go there. The other thing I'll bring up right now is movies. Films are different. Under 110 of the TEACH Act in distance education in a classroom like we're in today, face to face, if we've legally acquired the film, the video, the DVD, we can show the whole thing. And I think, Bruce, an issue came up in one of your distance education classes one time about how much of that we could show. And we ended up he did the fair use analysis, and um, I think we ended up feeling fairly comfortable to show the whole thing in distance ed. But we did the analysis. We talked about it first before we ever went there. Again, even though the TEACH Act has a lot of criteria, remember, fair use did not go out the door. It is there for you all the time. The more we use it, the more we push back against those that want to take our copyrights away. Was it safe? For, so, so Mike's talking about maybe going to a conference or something. You're not sure. You know, hotels with the wireless and so forth. But in a normal online class, would it be a better practice to just provide the link instead of trying to? Capture Any time you can do it, and it's not going to interfere. Your apps, like Maria is doing there, uh, it's like journal articles. People want to pass those out. Uh, if they're in our databases, you can link to them and do so. Movies, uh, do not please put that thing up in Sakai and link to it. Remember, it's face-to-face -face classroom. UCLA, a lawsuit was brought against them for just that thing. They had a net streaming license. They put it up in their um, course management system and were streaming. Students were watching them at home. They got sued. The lawsuit was dismissed on a technicality. We still don't know that one. Is the license going to control? Is fair use? We don't know. So therefore, do not link into movies. Show what you need to. See, the idea of putting it in a face-to-face -face classroom, this stuff, is they leave, you take it down. It's not setting up there where somebody else can get to it. That's the whole point. If you put links into uh, like a video, um, if you're doing a link to a YouTube, be sure you feel comfortable with fair use. But videos are limited, legally acquired, normally shown in face-to-face -face classrooms, unless, like Bruce, you can bring it in. And he took it down. He didn't leave it up there. So remember that. Do you know what the permalink is? It's different than um, when you go in to, let's say, Academic Search Premier, you pull up a full text article. It's up. Up at the top is your URL. That is not the one you use for a permalink. What you use is Normally, up there sitting in a little box like this, just above the article, is going to be another identifier. If you go over to the side, there'll be something that looks like a, a link from a chain link fence, and it'll say PERMA link. Click on that, and you can copy that link and put it into your Sakai. Because I know some people have tried doing the URL, and they've come and they say, it's not linking in. 
you need that permalink. And um, if you've got any questions, email Ann or I, and we will send you um, a screenshot of exactly where it is. But you're OK. That's the way to do it, actually. I had someone, it was in distance education recently, with just the problem I talked about. She was trying to do the right thing. She couldn't get the link. And I realized, oh, you're not using the permalink. That's what we prefer for you all to do. We license these. And in negotiating these license agreements, we have gotten the download rights for you. We have also tried to get other rights in there. So yes, link where you can. And um, also, if there is um, an issue there, you're having a problem, get in touch with us on that. And, and I just to kind of finish my earlier story with the Christian Leadership Program, what we ended up doing, since of course we <laughs> couldn't get the rights to patent it, you know, we also had some kind of more obscure documentaries about, for example, Christianity and Africa and different things. But we found, we actually asked students to download it, to purchase it from Amazon. So they would have to spend the $3. But it's, it's, it's a, a legal use of, of the, the piece. So that's, that was our solution. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a very good point Anne makes, because your options are it's not under copyright, that we can bring it in under fair use, we can go in maybe and buy it, and we have the rights to use it. Lastly, we can go into the permission market. So there are four options here. Let's, let's move on to Creative Commons. That's this handout to talk about how you can get legal <laughs> media, all different types of media. And honestly, the website is golden. This, um, the library has a website on Creative Commons. It has lots of tabs, and it's, it's really great. So um, it's under our LibGuides. And the thing about Creative Commons is why is it there? Why didn't we have this 50 years ago? Creative Commons, in its simplest form, means I write an article, I put it under a Creative Commons license. Normally these are, you may use it freely with attribution. This exists with any medium, any format. Learn to look for this. Right here, you see this little box right here, this gray? If you see this on something, it's a Creative Commons symbol. Like I said, when you start checking to see if I can use something, look for that to see if it's on there. Why do we have it? Is some of your academics that are very conversant on copyright about 15 years ago, as the publishers started to push back, wanting to extend the term of copyright more and more. You know, now we're the life of the author plus 70 years. That means in our lifetime, most of what is created is going to stay under a copyright license. We can't use it. This is a pushback. This is also your open source movement. This is part of it. Under open source, you have software, you have education materials, you have open access. And under open access, we are now publishing journals online, peer reviewed, you can publish in that are open, meaning I can go in there with this, use it in my work, do attribution. Creative Commons was started by Lawrence Lessig, who is a major pioneer in the open access movement. It's a nonprofit corporation. You can go into their website, pick one of these licenses out. Now, once you pick it, that's it. You mean, if, pardon me, Sue, if you're the copyright creator, the copyright owner? Exactly. Yes, Thanks, you know, Anne. Yeah. Thanks. You on the copyright. And um, it applies to any medium. Now, this first one is the most common one. It is by attribution. They've got them non-commercial use, various ones. The reason being, when you pick it, it's free. You don't have to pay to put it on there. You license it. Is I rely on it. So if you've picked out one of these and I come across your material and I use it in my class, you can't take it off of there and come back and try and sue me and play games with me. This is pretty serious stuff. So once you pick one, it stays there for life. But 
We have within here, can we show them, um, there are creative common sites for YouTube. There are creative common sites for Flickr. There are creative common sites for sound recordings, movies. These are, could be your best friends, meaning you can use them, do the attribution. So check this out. We've put up a number of these. Now, we did not include in here some education materials because there's a whole range of those. We hope at some time maybe we can do another um, workshop on open source education materials and um, MOOCs and all of this huge movement that is coming about. And, but check this out because Google has a place for images. And the other thing I would bring up that we have, and we specifically got it for images, is Art Store. It is on your handout. Luba Zakharoff, one of our librarians, has done a libguide on this. She has also linked you in to the tutorials. Art Store is one of our databases. You can go in there and freely use most of that art. Again, tell us where you got it from. But that can be a valuable resource, and there is even a tutorial in there how, I don't know how to do it. I'd like to learn. You can bring it up and embed it in your PowerPoint. Just do attribute. And I think they even have a line supplied there for your attribution. It's very easy if you know how to do it. So Creative Commons, learn, check it out, use it. So this, I, I just brought up Art Store. So let's go to our fourth handout. We we're handout heavy today. And I love this, <laughs> this cartoons kind of artwork. So um, yeah, Luba in the library sent us uh, some nice information about Art Store. That's just, that's just one of the resources you have. So this, this document is sorted by, at the very top, Creative Commons. In fact, you could just start with that first link, and you're, you're golden. But I thought I'd pull out some of the resources for other media. So we have video. We talked about YouTube. There's also Vimeo. And then under Art is Art Store. And I just did a quick little search. And th there's a lot of stuff. There's photographs. There's, there's illustrations and so forth. Um, Flickr is very um, a, a grassroots type of uh, situation, right? Where just, you know, people, regular people are creating artwork, taking photographs. And so there is a Creative Commons section of Flickr. Um, and before I even knew about Creative Commons, I went into Flickr, this is many years ago, and I just asked the artist, asked the photographer if I could use their stuff. I've done that also with, with textbook authors. You know, may I use your, your quiz or your pages this to this? So you can also just contact the owner of the copyright. Um, and then under music, I, I, I got to say, um, I, you know, music, you know, it's been found that music can be distracting. So there are studies done by a guy named Richard Mayer at UC Santa Barbara where people were trying to perform a task when narration was playing and music, and the performance was actually worse with the music. So you need to be uh, cautious about music. It could be good for a little intro, a little outro, uh, but I, I would be cautious about that. When I went into these two websites listed here, I got to say, I, I didn't see a place to get it for free. It seemed like there was. A, you could listen to it for free, but I, I, they kind of wanted money from it. And let me kind of open it up. And Tom, if you found a totally free music source, I think have you found a, okay, in Creative, in Creative Commons, yeah. okay. And and another yeah. place on there, it's not in Creative Commons. I originally went in for the students a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, they're always downloading music and getting in trouble. <laughs> Copyright alternatives, when you go in there for those first guides, a lot of that's music. And another good place to find some good downloads and music in particular, I think I linked into Educause. Educause can be very good uh, on all of this. Um, because, you know, Educause, it started, it, it is the technological aspect of higher education. That's what the organization is focused on. And one thing, if you are looking for music, you can uh, select from different genre, and then and you listen to different things. And I'm not saying it's all good, 
but uh, you, you're able to pull something. There's quite a bit out there. And if you choose rap music, do instrumentals, not the lyrics. <laughs> Probably right. Yeah, that's probably true. But uh, I mean, another point. Um, yeah, is uh, please, if you do use lyrics, please listen to the lyrics. And yeah, Anne's brought up Sherpa Romeo. So th the last one is text. So we don't always think of text. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we focus on text a lot outside of this kind of multimedia space that we're talking about, but. It is also a form of media, and so this was neat. Is um, uh, we've added this Sher Sherpa under text, Sherpa Romeo and Roar. Sherpa Romeo is where you can go in and search for online peer-reviewed journals that will publish. So you can search it on here, and sometimes we do this for faculty. And the other one, Roar, is open institutional repositories that you can go in and search for materials. There are some really good university repositories, even by discipline. And um, that is another resource. And they're open, which the material in there is open. That's the reason we brought this up, is Sherpa Romeo is open journals you may want to consider. Um, find one that's in your discipline, you know the material in there is open. The same with institutional repositories. Anything else? Any other questions or comments? Sue, you have anything? All right. Maybe that's it. <laughs> we, th we thank you all. We thank you very much for coming. Thank you.